Well, as I say, we begin tonight with the breaking news reporting in The Washington Post tonight. The Washington Post is reporting, quote, the Turkish government has told U.S. officials that it has audio and video recordings that prove Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi was killed inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul this month, according to U.S. and Turkish officials. The recordings show that a Saudi security team detained Khashoggi in the consulate after he walked in on October 2nd to obtain an official document before his upcoming wedding, then killed him and dismembered his body, the officials said. The audio recording that officials describe reportedly contains gruesome evidence of what happened to Khashoggi inside the consulate. Quote, you can hear his voice and the voices of men speaking Arabic, a person said. You can hear how he was interrogated, tortured, and then murdered. Turkish officials are reportedly concerned that releasing such a recording could reveal Turkish intelligence gathering techniques on embassies and consulates in their country. The president began his day with a phone call to Fox and Friends and even the president's best friends at Fox and Friends were surprised to hear him say this morning that U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia are now, his word, excellent. What's at stake with U.S.-Saudi relations, sir? Uh, I would say they're excellent. You can't be killing no, Washington Post be. journalists. So is everything in jeopardy right. now, sir? Is, uh, is, is that in jeopardy now, our good I, relations I, I with Saudi to, Arabia? I have to find out what happened. I mean, I do have yeah. to find yeah. out. And we're probably getting closer than you might think. But I have to find out well, what the, happened. Fox & Friends obviously has a better grasp than the president of what the Jamal Khashoggi story should mean for U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia. Later that morning, the president proved, as in all things, that for him, it is all about the money. No matter how many reporters Saudi Arabia might decide to murder, we still have to be nice to them if they buy U.S. weapons systems. I would not be in favor of stopping a country from spending $110 billion, which is an all-time record, and letting Russia have that money and letting China have that money. But what good does that do us? Again, this took place in Turkey. And to the best of our knowledge, uh, Khashoggi is not a United States citizen. Is that right? Or is that right? He's a permanent resident. OK. We don't like it, John. We don't like it. And we don't like it even a little bit. But as to whether or not we should stop $110 billion from being spent in this country, knowing they have four or five alternatives, two very good alternatives, that would not be acceptable to me. Everything the president said there is a lie. There is no deal to sell $110 billion in weapon systems to Saudi Arabia. And in fact, it would be very difficult for Saudi Arabia to obtain new weapon systems from other countries that would be compatible with the weapon systems that Saudi Arabia has already heavily invested in from the United States. Bruce Rydell of the Brookings Institution told The Washington Post today it would take decades to transition from U.S. and U.K. aircraft, for example, to Russian or Chinese aircraft. Same is true for tanks, communications equipment, and other high-tech equipment. Then the Saudis don't have time, given they are bogged down in Yemen. When it comes to weapons systems, the United States has always been dealing with Saudi Arabia from a position of strength, something Donald Trump apparently does not know. It is Saudi Arabia that desperately needs American weapon systems, not the United States that needs desperately to sell them to Saudi Arabia. Donald Trump personally has always loved doing business with Saudi Arabia, no matter what they do around the world. Saudi Arabia, and I get along great with all of them. They buy apartments from me, they spend 40 million, 50 million. Am I supposed to dislike them? I like them very much. Joining our discussion now, Shane Harris, intelligence and national security reporter who helped break tonight's story in The Washington Post. Shane, thank you very much for joining us tonight on this breaking news night. There are, there are four of you bylined on this. I can see that it was teamwork. Uh, but what is your assessment of, of what the evidence base is here, knowing what you know? Uh, you have reports from officials who are aware of these audio tapes. What do we know about who has actually heard them? 
Well, I think our understanding at this point, our best understanding is that the Turks have heard them uh, and have access to this material and believe that it's very compelling uh, and demonstrates proof in their mind uh, that Jamal Khashoggi was killed and tortured inside the consulate. Um, they have shared the information, as we understand it, about what these recordings show and what you can hear on them. It's not clear with the American officials. It's not clear to us that they have physically handed over the material to the U.S. side so that it can be assessed and analyzed. Uh, but I have to say, from talking to U.S. officials about this in the past 24 to 48 hours, I'm not hearing anyone say that they don't believe what the Turks are saying or that they don't find it persuasive. No one is necessarily come out and saying, we've defined proof positive that it's legitimate, but I'm not hearing the kind of pushback and skepticism you might normally hear from intelligence officials if they thought the information was flawed or, or, or that it was uh, incorrect. You're also reporting tonight that one other uh, element of evidence is that a friend of Khashoggi's texted him uh, after he entered the consulate, and that text uh, was never received. There's evidence that it wasn't received, uh, and, and uh, clearly that indicates that uh, Khashoggi has not been in a position since shortly after entering uh, the consulate to respond or receive a text. Right. And this also, you know, this comes with other pieces of information, sort of the absence of information in some cases. There's surveillance footage that has been leaked out showing him walking into the consulate. There's nothing showing him leaving. So you're sort of what we're seeing now, and this is the typical in a case like this where you have this sort of mystery, is these different pieces of information and intelligence, the mosaic, are all starting to line up. Um, clearly, the Turks believe from the beginning that since there was footage of him going in and not coming out, that was pretty damning. Uh, but now, I think what we're seeing is that they really believe that this other, you know, very documented type of information, quite graphic and gruesome, as you and Rachel said at the top, uh, demonstrates to their mind, I think, conclusively what happened here. Adding to our discussion now, Malcolm Nance, an MSNBC counterterrorism and intelligence analyst, and Ruth Marcus, deputy editorial page editor and columnist at The Washington Post and an MSNBC contributor. Uh, and Malcolm, your reaction to the story as it's developed at this point? I have two different reactions to this story. The first one is the technical intelligence that the Turks have demonstrated, if this story is true, if there are audio recordings, means that the Turks have had all of these embassies and consulates wired for some time. I mean, to go into the bowels of that building and to get audio or, you know, audio recordings of a murder means that they, they know everything that's going on in that building, and they're very confident about how it's done. The second part is a little more disturbing. The chain of information that we've seen reported from the Post about U.S. intelligence knowing, uh, having information about the Saudis' participation in this or issuing orders on this, we have a system set up so that the president of the United States is informed of critical flash traffic like that within five minutes, which means the president would have had to have known about the outlines of this plot and the murder almost instantaneously. Uh, Ruth Marcus, uh, your reaction to what President Trump had to say both about Saudi Arabia and the Khashoggi case today? Um, well, my reaction has to be colored um, by this terrible news that my colleague Shane has reported and by the fact that I represent the opinion section of The Washington Post that employed Jamal Khashoggi and we're all I'm struggling for the adjectives to convey our horror at um, these reports and our heartbreak for him and his family. And I have to say, all of those emotions are exacerbated and many times over by the notion that the president of the United States, speaking about someone who lived in the United States, someone who worked for a U.S. newspaper, someone who was doing his job, which was to um, tell the truth as he understood it about the country that he loved, that the president would describe our relations with Saudi Arabia as excellent and that the president would talk about um, these relations in dollar terms and not in humanity and human rights terms. Mm. And uh, Shane Harris, uh, what do you think of the the available avenues uh, for uh, you to be pursuing on this story as it's developing? 
Well, I think there's a big question still here about, uh, you know, to, to coin the old phrase, use the old phrase, what did the president know and when did he know it? Uh, our previous reporting in the paper uh, this week showed that there were intercepts that the United States had of Saudi officials discussing a separate effort to lure Jamal Khashoggi back to Saudi Arabia, where would he would be detained. And there has been some speculation among our sources that perhaps what transpired at the consulate was sort of a plan B, if you will, when those efforts to get him to come back under his own will to Saudi Arabia failed. So if there was information about potential threats to Jamal Khashoggi before he ever went into that consulate, the question then becomes who knew about that in the government and was that ever presented to the president? And as Malcolm said, there are mechanisms to elevate intelligence uh, from the bottom up to the president when people feel that he needs to know it. And those are questions that we'd like to try to answer. Malcolm Nance, when the president talks about the $110 billion uh, that, that uh, Saudi Arabia wants to spend on American systems, uh, what he's talking about is a big list of things that were developed during the Obama administration. The Obama, uh, President Obama uh, was willing to approve $115 billion uh, in acquisitions by Saudi Arabia, but they couldn't afford it. Uh, they, they only were able to obtain about, about half of that at the time, uh, and none of the things on this list are new. Uh, the president seems to think that uh, the United States is in a, a desperate uh, vendor relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia, and we desperately need them to buy this material because they will immediately go to the Chinese or someone else. Well, that was a very unfortunate statement that the president made about uh, the 100, you know, compromising potentially $110 billion of arms sales over this issue of Khashoggi, which tells the Saudis what Donald Trump's price is to buy is silence. Uh, those sales are not real. They are projections. They are wish lists and fantasies. The Obama administration last sale was $25 billion. And I think Donald Trump, watching the news that Pakistan um, recently made a large arms sale from China and that India made a, a missile sale from Russia, that he sees this as some sort of arms bazaar, which, which is what we've always dominated in the Middle East, but that, that's his number one priority, uh, not the defense of U.S. residents or citizens, and perhaps not even the defense of democracy himself, because he told the Saudis he was not going to be getting involved in their business anymore. And I'm sure that was, new, that was uh, you know, uh, news to their ears and something that they would please, be pleased by. And, and Ruth Marcus, of course, there are suspicions about uh, the Saudi relationship to the president financially, to the president's son-in-law financially, on their personal finances. Um, there, there are, but I think this um, needs to go beyond actually looking just at the Trump family or the Trump organization's relationship with the Saudis. And we're going to need to look as we discover the facts here as we seek to hold people accountable. We're going to need to look at Saudi influence and the tentacles of Saudi money that go beyond the Trump family that extend to the extensive lobbyists on the Saudi payroll, to the think tanks in Washington that take Saudi money, to the foreign agents that represent the Saudi government. And we're going to have to ask everybody who, if if all of these terrible reports turn out to be true, if the Saudi government was involved at the highest levels, we're going to just have to ask everybody who works for them, who takes money from them, who is on their payroll, whose side are you on? What are you doing? Um, where is your humanity and belief in human rights and a free press? And so, yes, um, let's look at the relationships between the Trump Organization and the Saudi government, but let's not stop there. Ruth Marcus, thanks for starting our conversation tonight. Malcolm Nance, thank you. And Shane Harris, thank you for your invaluable reporting and getting us started tonight. Really appreciate it. And when we come back, Jason Johnson will join us from Georgia, where he is reporting on the latest efforts by Republicans to block the vote there, to deny thousands and thousands of people from being able to exercise their legal right to vote. And also later, what John Kelly said today about Elizabeth Warren, which of course confirms everything we already knew about John Kelly.
We have breaking news tonight in what is truly developing as an election scandal in Georgia, where the Georgia NAACP is preparing to sue Secretary of State Brian Kemp in response to reports that his office has put on hold tens of thousands of voter registration applications before this coming election. Those are being held indefinitely. The Republican strategy for winning elections now in a country where they are outnumbered by Democrats and outnumbered by independents is to prevent Democrats from voting. That's why Republican state governments around the country have done everything they can to close voting locations that are easily accessible to Democrats and to simply kick Democrats off the voting rolls for any excuse they can find, and in many cases for no good or legal reason at all. Nowhere is this strategy of trying to win by preventing voting more glaring than in the Georgia governor's race this year, where the Republican Secretary of State, Brian Kemp, is running for governor. As Secretary of State, Brian Kemp, Kemp has been, in effect, the top election official in the state of Georgia. And so, with his eyes on the prize of the governorship, Brian Kemp has, for years, been canceling the voter registrations of Democrats. He has canceled over 1.4 million voter registrations, and that's in a state that only has 6.4 million registered voters. Brian Kemp has gotten rid of 20% of the voters in Georgia. We have never seen a 20% voter purge of voters in a state. And now the Associated Press is reporting that Brian Kemp's office has simply seized and is holding 53,000 voter registration applications, which it might just hold and suppress forever. Brian Kemp's claimed justification for seizing these applications is his policy called exact match, which means if you leave out a middle initial in your name that is somehow already on file in some other record that the state has, then your voter registration application is not an exact match for the state's pre-existing information about you, and you are presumed to be a voting criminal, someone who's trying to falsely register and criminally register to vote, a phenomenon not known to actually exist in the United States. Brian Kemp knows where to find the Democrats who he doesn't want to vote in Georgia, and that is why 70% of the voter registration applications that Brian Kemp is blocking are from African-American voters in a state where African-American population is 32%. Brian Kemp is simply the most obvious of the grotesque, racist voter suppressors who believe voter suppression is necessary to Republican election victories. He is running against Stacey Abrams, who said this today. Feels like deja vu four years ago, Trump, Kemp tried to keep 40,000 new voters off the rolls. It took a few years, but we beat him. A few months ago, he tried to close polling places, but we beat him there too. Now he's at it again, and we'll beat him again. We will work to process the 53,000 but we don't have to wait for justice. We've got 27 days of action, so we'll beat him in absentee ballots. We'll beat him at early voting starting October 15th, and we'll beat him on November 6th. Brian Kemp has called us out. Let's vote, and let's get it done. Joining us now from Georgia, Jason Johnson, politics editor at TheRoot.com and an MSNBC contributor, and Aisha Moody Mills, Democratic strategist and social impact advisor. Jason, uh, what are you discovering as you report there in Georgia tonight? Uh, I'm discovering that this is sort of a, a rehash of eyes on the prize. Uh, I was here four years ago, and, and I spoke to John Lewis, and he talked to me about this. He said this, this is what he saw uh, in the 1960s. The, the difference is this, and I want everybody to understand. No matter what Brian Kemp is trying to do, no matter how many polling places he's trying to shut down, no matter how many new registrations he's trying to destroy, the Democratic Party here, the New Georgia Project, and the Abrams campaign anticipated this voter suppression. Their pathway to success was never dependent on new registrations, but they're going to fight just as hard as anybody else to make sure that everybody here can participate in the franchise. Aisha, I, I want to take a look at the... Uh the latest poll, this is a Survey USA poll, and it shows a statistical tie uh, mm -hmm. within the margin of error. Kemp at 47, Stacey Abrams at 45. Uh, and there's Stacey Abrams in a statistical tie in a race where the Democrat isn't really supposed to come close. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, and so let's just talk about the math here. This is what this is really about. It's about the math and it's about her pathway to victory. She needs to get 90 percent of people of color in the state to vote for her, which is pretty easy because the majority of them are African-American. She also, though, here's the interesting factor, needs, well, what Kemp needs is for her to not have any more than 40 percent of the electorate be people of color. This gets interesting because about 36 percent of Georgia is African-American and we're not even counting Latinos. So it's a it's not coincidental then that Brian Kemp would want to keep new African Americans from being able to register because the more people of color who are in the registration pool, it starts to tick the number up higher um, of the electorate that she can actually win in order to win the state. So there's a direct correlation between Stacey Abrams' path to victory and and Brian Kemp's attempt to keep the voters that she needs from being able to vote. And it's just it's just simple math. Uh, Jason, uh, give us the worst case scenario here um, uh, from the Democrats' perspective. If if all fifty three thousand of those votes uh, are are not allowed to vote, uh, can can the turnout model be worked? Can is there a turnout uh, plan in place that can still deliver a victory margin for the Democrats? Yeah, there, there is still a pathway to success, Lawrence. Um, it's always been a thin path. This is a red state. And, and I've said all along, and I've talked to both Republicans and Democrats down here, look, the fact that Brian Kemp and Stacey Abrams are tied 30 days out means Brian Kemp's actually losing. That's, that's not a good sign in right, a red state yeah. where there should be a cakewalk for him. Here's yep. the catch. For the Abrams campaign to actually win, not only do they have to have those numbers, they have to make sure that all the absentee ballots come in, they have to make sure that there's relatively high turnout, and they have to make sure that the men and women throughout the state in the rural areas are able to vote and participate. Mm -hmm. One important thing to understand about the state of Georgia is that there are lots of rural African Americans who are often not polled, not paid attention to. And there are many people here, there are some internal pollsters who I've talked to who have said, look, the black electorate might be upwards of 28, 29 percent. And if that's the case, and that those people aren't being voted, if those people aren't being polled, there's a good chance that Abrams can pull this off. Only if people participate, only if they vote, and only if people keep fighting against this kind of suppression, because this is not the only thing Brian Kemp is going to try and pull before November 6th. Jason Johnson, thank you for joining us live from Georgia tonight. Aisha Moody Mills, please stay with us for another discussion coming up. When we come back, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly's problem with women reveals itself again, this time in his own words about Senator Elizabeth Warren. It is now impossible to tell the difference between Donald Trump and John Kelly. They are only a few years apart in age, and they both grew up in northeastern urban racist neighborhoods. Donald Trump in Queens and New York City, John Kelly in Brighton and Boston. They both grew up in what was still the Neanderthal age of America's treatment of women. They both grew up in a country where you could still be murdered for being a, bla a black person trying to register to vote or being a white person trying to help a black person trying to register to vote. And there is no evidence that Donald Trump or John Kelly ever objected to any of that. There is no evidence that they ever protested anything about the world they were born into. And today, thanks to BuzzFeed's Freedom of Information Act request, we now see John Kelly's email about Senator Elizabeth Warren in the early days of the Trump administration, in which he tells one of his assistants that Senator Elizabeth Warren is an, quote, impolite, arrogant woman and quote, because she called John Kelly when he was Secretary of Homeland Security and complained to him that the Trump administration was illegally not following the court orders that federal judges in Massachusetts and New York issued to block the Trump Muslim ban that was unconstitutional and illegally implemented. John Kelly knew with confidence that he could tell the man working for him that Elizabeth Warren was an impolite, arrogant woman, and that man would understand exactly what he meant, because that man was Kevin Carroll, an Irish American with the same views of women that John Kelly and Donald Trump have. John Kelly and Kevin Carroll's Irish ancestors came to this country in poverty and starving and were welcomed in places like the Port of Boston, which Elizabeth Warren was fighting to preserve as an entry point for deserving immigrants. But their Irish heritage had no effect on John Kelly and Kevin Carroll's view of the immigrants who were trying to enter in those same places where their ancestors entered. John Kelly is the White House official 
whose public conduct is as despicable as Donald Trump's. Not as frequently despicable, but despicable enough. He is the man who called an African-American congresswoman an empty barrel and accused her of lying. And when that was instantly proven false, when John Kelly was instantly proved to be the liar about Congresswoman Frederica Wilson, John Kelly refused to apologize. He held that ground that the old racist neighborhood that he grew up in would have been so proud of. John Kelly's old neighborhood has changed a lot since he lived there. It is now integrated. It has a lot less racism than it used to, but we don't know how much John Kelly has changed, if at all, since he lived there. When John Kelly was exposed to the world as a liar about an African-American congresswoman, of course he wouldn't apologize. He wouldn't apologize to an African-American woman for anything, including lying about her and calling her a dehumanizing term. And so there is no real news in John Kelly's women problem. He is the man who told the lie that women were held sacred when he was growing up. And he knew that was a lie when he said it. And he knew it was a lie when he was a child and experienced the truth. He saw the way women were actually held down in those days in so many ways, not just in his neighborhood, but in the entire country, denied employment simply because they were women. Entire categories of employment were shut off to women when John Kelly tells the lie that they were held sacred. Kevin Carroll, the apparently soulless flunky who received John Kelly's email about Elizabeth Warren being an impolite, arrogant woman, replied, too bad Senate Majority Leader McConnell couldn't order her to be quiet again, exclamation point. Warren is running for president so early, trying too hard and chasing bad pitches. That email is from a flunky who works for Donald Trump, who started running for re-election for president and fundraising for re-election the day after inauguration. Order her to be quiet again. That's what John Kelly's flunky wanted Mitch McConnell to do to Elizabeth Warren, not realizing that when Mitch McConnell tried to do that to Elizabeth Warren on the Senate floor, he made Elizabeth Warren a political folk hero for anyone who does not worship at the altar of Trump. I call the senator to order under the provisions of Rule 19. Mr. President. Senator from Massachusetts. Mr. President, I am surprised that the words of Coretta Scott King are not suitable for debate in the United States Senate. I ask leave of the Senate to continue my remarks. Is there objection? Object. I appeal the ruling. Object. Objection is heard. The Senator will take her seat. And here is how the cowardly lion of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, later described that moment. She was warned. She was given an explanation. Nevertheless, she persisted. And with that, nevertheless, she persisted, became a unifying cry for Elizabeth Warren and against Mitch McConnell and against Donald Trump and against the likes of his flunkies and everyone else who thinks that a woman raising her voice for justice for immigrants is an impolite, arrogant woman. John Kelly had many Trump team flunkies working for him at the Department of Homeland Security, and he has many Trump team flunkies working around him in the White House now. But John Kelly surely is Donald Trump's flunky in chief. Olivia Nuzzi reports that in the middle of an Oval Office interview with Donald Trump, Trump turned to John Kelly and said, General, what do you think of the president? He asked. He's a great president, Kelly said. John Kelly is Donald Trump. After this break, Ruth Marcus and Aisha Moody Mills will join us with their take on John Kelly's view of that impolite, arrogant woman. Here is another look at John Kelly lying about a woman. And a congresswoman uh, stood up, and in the long tradition of empty barrels making the most noise, stood up there and all of that, and talked about how she was instrumental in getting the funding for that building, even for someone that 
is that empty a barrel? We were stunned. Every word of that was a lie. Aisha Moody Mills and Ruth Marcus are back with us. Uh, and Aisha, I want to get your reaction to uh, what we discover in these emails now, which I have to say didn't come as a surprise. Uh, that, that uh, Home, Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly really, really horrified that Elizabeth Warren was concerned uh, about the legality of how things were working in the Port of Boston. Lawrence, thank you so much for just laying that out the way that you did. I wish that we were all surprised, but we're not. Um, the reality is, is that this is just more of the same of Trump's ilk and the people that he surrounds himself with. The misogyny is so just disgusting coming out of this administration. And I'm not really sure what they think their strategy is. Do they really think that they're going to win uh, these midterms exclusively with white men of a certain generation? Because they're not. And, and what's at least exciting to come of this kind of rhetoric is that we're seeing women push back. More and more and more women are standing up and leaving the Republican Party, first of all. Um, and we're seeing more women run for office than ever before. In fact, running for Congress right now, there's more women and more people of color running than white men. And so I think that, you know, they're really resisting something. Um, but what they're going to find is that their power is really going to slip out from under them with this kind of talk and this kind of rhetoric. It's really just unfortunate. Uh, Ruth Marcus, uh, your reaction to this? Well, it's very clear that um, John Kelly, much like the president that he works for, does not like women who pipe up and um, really has think, a hard Ruth, time. Ruth, I think, I think the word you were looking for there is speak. He doesn't like women who <laughs> know speak. Know their place. Is, is That's it just it speak? Is. <laughs> right. Isn't it and, just speak? <laughs> uh, and, and he doesn't like them as Senator McConnell um, doesn't like them when they persist in speaking up. Yes, correct. But I think, yeah. it's, I think it's also really important for us to remember that it's not just that... Um, what women say or don't say that is problematic about the chief of staff. It's the way he acted when somebody who worked for him and the president in an extremely sensitive position was credibly accused of, including with photographs, of abusing women. And he dismissed that and ignored it and described the Rob Porter, the staff secretary, who had beaten his wives as a fine person who was being unduly persecuted. So it's not just his snippy language about women. It's his failure to um, care about women when they're abused. Uh, his, his, his written words exactly at the time. And these were written, so he thought about it. Rob Porter is a man of true integrity and honor. Uh, yeah. that, that was his reaction to uh, uh, violence against uh, women that Rob Porter had engaged in with both of his former wives. Uh, Aisha, I, I wanted us to listen to what Elizabeth Warren said uh, back in 2017, talking about this whole uh, moment on the Senate floor that uh, Kevin Carroll, the... the uh, flunky there in the Homeland Security Department was so thrilled by. And when people have asked me, so how did you feel about that and so on, I always say, this wasn't about me. This is about tens of millions of women who are tired of being told to sit down and be quiet. So stay <laughs> And Aisha, it seems to me that John Kelly and Kevin Carroll and Donald Trump have no comprehension of any of those women. No, they don't. And you would wonder if they have uh, mothers, if they have daughters. I mean, I think that they completely ignored the Women's March, right, and just thought that that was just a coup. And they're completely ignoring all of the women who are standing up in the United States Senate saying, hold on, we're going to be heard. And they're completely ignoring them. I mean, look, here, here is, is the reality, is that we keep seeing time and time and time again Donald Trump and his friends and the people that he surrounds himself with uh, and, and, and in the White House show us who they really are. And they don't think that women should speak. They don't think that women should step out of line. They think that we should know our place. Um, and that's something that, you know, it frustrated me when so many women actually voted for him. But I think we're seeing all those women start to peel off, especially in the districts that matter in these midterms in the House. Um, so I'm hoping that they keep running their mouths, that they keep saying foolish things, and that we keep bringing it to light, because that's going to keep women from actually supporting them. 
And Ruth, uh, when we see the, the private email traffic uh, that, that they think is private and they foolishly believe, they don't understand that it's a government record, it's going to become public someday, uh, these people like Kevin Carroll, these people who are deep inside the middle of the Trump bureaucracy, we see there uh, that, that attitude. The reason I really wanted to isolate him, even as much as John Kelly, is that that's the kind of brain that's all over the Trump administration, names we don't even know. Uh, yeah, I think none of us have gotten the message that um, if we put it in email and the, especially if we put something stupid in email, I'm sure I never have, um, that the likelihood is greater that it will come out and you all need to be careful. But people expose themselves. It's very hard to hide that. I'm sure that in private conversations, it's even more overt. But it's a little, it's a glimpse. It's a, you, we saw that glimpse um, from Senator McConnell. We see it overtly from the president uh, all the time when, when he talks about um, Senator Warren as Pocahontas, uh, a different um, level of offensiveness. And, and we see it in these emails um, from the, the chief of staff and his assistant, you know, the notion that it's too bad that the majority leader couldn't get her to quiet down and shut up, really. And their tone deafness, they still didn't understand how that actually worked very well for Elizabeth Warren and not for Mitch McConnell. They still didn't get it. Ruth Marcus, Aisha Moody Mills, thank you both very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. We'll be right back. Today, a Russian Soyuz rocket malfunctioned two minutes after liftoff on a mission to deliver an American astronaut and a Russian cosmonaut to the International Space Station. U.S. astronaut Nick Haig and Russian cosmonaut Alexei Ovchinin were both uninjured after their capsules separated from the rocket and returned to Earth safely. The history of space travel, like the history of all experimentation, is trial and error. Mistakes have always been part of the process in America's space program, and everyone involved has always understood that, and the mistakes can kill you. Nine U.S. astronauts have been killed during training and test flight missions, and 14 U.S. astronauts have been killed in flight during space missions. That deadly risk and the glory of success are captured in the new film First Man, starring Ryan Gosling as Neil Armstrong, the first man to set foot on the moon. You're too low. Climb. Control is degrading. Slow your rate. Do you read? Neil. Joining us now, Oscar-winning screenwriter Josh, Josh Singer. His latest movie, First Man, premieres in movie theaters tonight. And Josh, uh, directed by Damien Chazelle, Oscar winner. Uh, and you have you are now a book author because your screenplay... Where's the right shot for this? Your screenplay is now published in this book form. A lot of great pictures in it. And your notes from the script. Yeah, we uh, tried to give some context, historical context. You can't quite give in the film, as well as... We wanted to be transparent since we were dealing with an icon where we take license. We don't take much, but we take a little. The, uh, what we just saw this is, is part of what we saw in, in Russia today. The, the, and, and one of the things the film delivers so marvelously in ways that I had forgotten is, is the range of mistakes that were made, the risks that were taken before Neil Armstrong ever gets to go to the moon and lives that were lost in the process of getting there, that constantly dealing with setbacks and getting back up and keep going. Yeah, in the 60s, NASA sugarcoated things, and they had good reason to. I mean, uh, people don't remember, but the public support for the program declined dramatically in the 60s. Um, and so uh, NASA didn't want you to know how many failures there were, how many 
you know, how many near misses there were. Uh, Neil himself lost uh, two of his closest colleagues. They were up on that screen a minute mm -hmm. ago. Uh, and he himself almost died several times, in including mm -hmm. uh, the LLRV accident, which you just saw uh, us uh, uh, dramatize there. Uh, and in that accident, if he had not uh, ejected, if he had two and a half, he had, he had uh, uh, sorry, two fifths of a second uh, left before, you know, if he yeah. hadn't hit the eject button, he would have, he would have died right then. And, um, you know, so we try to get underneath that story, uh, which I think most people don't actually know and certainly don't remember. No. And, it, and one of the things it is, is a story about when government was ambitious. Uh, this was president Kennedy saying we really ought to do this and government got behind it and did it. And there was bipartisan support. It ran into a certain amount of budget criticism over time, but everything does. Uh, we just, the, the, the kind of spirit of we can do this and we in government can do this is something that seems to have disappeared. Yeah, I think it's a spirit throughout the country. I think uh, it was a time when people were asking uh, what they could do for their country rather than what mm -hmm. their country could do for them. Uh, you know, Kennedy himself said we do this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And, and that's something you see very clearly in our film. And I, I find it more inspiring, the fact that Neil had such grace uh, and, and his whole family to deal mm -hmm. with these sacrifices. I mean, they lost their next door neighbor and Janet was close friends with Pat White. Mm -hmm. uh, it was horrible to watch. And yet they, they persevered. Uh, that's something that I think is incredibly heroic incredibly noble and something uh, we should look back on. Uh, and it's a deeply personal story. Uh, Neil Armstrong, I did not know this, lost a baby daughter uh, to cancer. I had no idea. Uh, through you at the Toronto Film Festival, I met Neil's two sons, and they told us, told you, uh, how sheltered they were from the risks that their father was taking. Yeah, we, we uh, cover that a little bit. We have a, a scene uh, which is based on their own recollections of when Neil talked to them about what was going to happen when he went to the moon and, and talked to them about the risks, but, you know, I think minimized a little bit. Uh, and uh, again, these families, though, they, they saw what happened next door. Everyone knew someone who had lost a dad mm -hmm. uh, or a husband. They lived close by. These astronauts. Uh, oh, they all yeah. lived in. They all lived right around uh, Houston, and uh, you know Neil lived in El Lago, but they lived in little developments. So yeah, Ed White, uh, who died in the Apollo One fire, lived next door. Uh, you know, and and they'd spend a lot of time there. They would work over each other's houses, so they were really a, a very small, tightly knit community. Josh Singer, you've done it again. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Tonight's last word is next. The brilliant one and only Sarah Silverman asked me to play the part of an anchorman in her Hulu series, I Love You, America, and I gave it my best shot. Ramby, let's start with you. Earlier this week, this tweet of yours went viral, reading, quote, why don't I need feminism? I have AR 15 reasons. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you triggered? Because the only trigger warning I need is the safety is off. Mm. <laughs> That was a good one. I know. Who are you? Like, where do you come from? Every other week, there's some new young conservative Barbie doll who comes out of nowhere. Well, so much for the tolerant left build a wall. Lock her up! Hey, can from, we check on Bramby? From, from, where do you from, come from? From, where do you come from? From, where do you come from? from, 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 from. <laughs> Your name is Bramby Streeter. That episode of Sarah Silverman's I Love You, America is available right now on Hulu. And Sarah Silverman gets tonight's last word. Hello, I'm Mark Evan Jackson from NBC's The Good Place and host of the official and appropriately titled The Good Place, The Podcast, where guests like Kristen Bell, Ted Danson and Mike Shore talk about everything on and off screen. Subscribe and listen free on your favorite podcast app.